An inaugural lecture marks a significant milestone in an academic career. For us, it is an occasion in which we as academic peers, colleagues, students, family, friends, and the public of Makanda celebrate the intellectual and scholarly achievements and contribution of one of our own. This evening, I have a singular <coughs> honor of presenting to you one of our US additions to the illustrious list of professors of the university, Professor Patrice Kabea Mwepu. On an occasion like this, we give a full introduction to our inaugural. <coughs> Professor Mwepu was born in the district of Ngandajika, about 80 kilometers from the Diamond Ridge town of Mbujimayu in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Ngandajika, despite being a village, was well known for its good schools, to which government officials and business people from the bigger towns and cities were sending their children for quality education. Patrice's father was a cook, and his mother, who he identifies as one of the main influences in his life, was a storyteller. <coughs> as a young boy, Patrice excelled in school. You see, there was an agreement between the school and his family to reduce his actual final marks from his usual above 90% to the 80% range. <laughs> this was done so that he would not be forced to skip a class. <laughs> His parents agreed that they did not want him to be the youngest in his class and to rather have him learn among his peers. After he passed primary school with a distinction, he went on to study at one of the most prestigious schools in the village, St. George's College. Entering St. George's College was a very exacting exercise. You needed to write an entrance exam, which of course he passed. At the college, Patrice registered to do humanities, measuring in Latin literature and philosophy. This choice was not arbitrary. He was motivated by his dream of becoming a Catholic priest. <laughs> Some of us. <laughs> However, as the only son in a family of eight children, both his parents and the high priest did not agree with his choice of vocation. They 
encouraged him to carry on with the studies so that he could carry the family name. Upon completion of high school, the priest remained at the college for a few years to teach Latin and religion. So loved was he by his learners that when time came for him to move on, they barricaded the road so that his bus could not move. <laughs> I just got off the bus and joined his students to assure them that he was no longer leaving the school. Two days later, when the students had dropped their guard, Patrice sneaked away <laughs> from the bath and river. <laughs> so he went on, he went off to the University of Lubashi, where he studied drawing philology, later known as French language and literature studies, and was hired as a junior lecturer upon completing his master. Due to political instability in the DRC, Patrice decided to leave his country of birth and moved to South Africa in 1998. Patrice is married to Francine Mwepu, who has been on his side for 25 years, and they are blessed with three children. Professor Mwepu's relationship with Rhodes University goes back 12 years. 12 years, where he was first employed as a senior lecturer, and in 2012 became the head of the School of Languages and Literature. He is also the director of the Confucius Institute at the university. Before that, he was a senior lecturer of French studies at the University of Western Cape, and a lecturer of French studies at the University of Cape Town, where he completed his PhD in French language and literature in 2001, on the same day as his first daughter, Chen Po. <laughs> Professor Mwepu has taught French studies for close to 30 years, and his students have ranged from undergraduate to PhD levels. He has taught French both locally and abroad, including at Jinan University in China. As part of his duties at Rhodes University, Professor Mwepu served on the Senate, the Language Committee, the Academic Promotions Committee, the Humanities Standing Committee, and the High Degrees Committee, the Institute of the Study of Englishes in Africa, the Theatre Management Committee, and is the Chair of the Research Committee of the School of Languages and Literatures. Professor Mwepu is, among other among others, a member of the executive board of the Association of French Studies in Southern Africa and the American Association of Teachers of, of French. Outside university, he is the editor-in-chief of the only accredited journal of French Studies in South Africa, French Studies in Southern Africa. And he's a member of the editorial board of two esteemed international journals of French, of French literature. Furthermore, he serves as a reviewer for a number of journals. Since 2000, Professor Mwepu has contributed 15 accredited and peer-reviewed journal articles and books, and has presented papers at nearly 30 conferences around the world, mainly on the topic of Francophone African literature. In 2011, he wrote his own book, which is a critical reflection on post-colonial writing by Francophone, by Francophone African writers, with a focus on one of the most influential and controversial African writers, Congolese politician Henri Lopez. Given his great contribution to research in this very niche area of expertise, it is no wonder that he was rated as one of the top 30 researchers at Rhodes University for 2016. Thanks to Professor Mwepu, Rhodes University is one of only two universities in South Africa that produce research on this topic, which is significant as this field doesn't easily attract students 
especially in non-French speaking countries. Although his focus is in French, Professor Mwepu is fluent in no less than 10 languages. <laughs> of course, he can speak French, write French. Over and above that, he is very fluent in English, the Swahili, Tuluba, Latin, Italiano, Lingala, Kikongo, Kanyon, and Nanja. From time to time, he becomes involved in translation and interpreting services, and has over the years provided this service to the African Editors Forum, the World Journalism Educators Summit, various higher education institutions, UNESCO, our own Highway Africa, and he has even translated parts of the South African Constitution for discussion between Congolese and South African politicians. Tonight, in this inaugural lecture, Professor Mwepu will explore how the word, whether spoken or written, rules life, and why we should care. He will speak about how literary critique transports us to the fantastical realm of invisible worlds, and how, without the critic, these worlds would remain apart. Every word forever tucked away from the mundane world of common knowledge. We will all join him in his interpretive journey through the learning of a young village boy. It is now my signal honor and a great privilege to invite Professor Patrice Mwepu to deliver his professorial inaugural lecture titled, Our Moral Imperatives Arising from the Otherwise Purposeless Acts. Professor Mwepu.
I also have to thank Dr. Semi Yunga, who is always with me all the Saturdays to do outreach program in our community. I have to thank my sister-in-law, Clarice Galula, who is here all the way from Australia, just to come and attend this lecture. I don't forget my sister, Giselle Zumba, who is here representing living and dead from all our claims back home in the DRC. I appreciate it. <laughs> I also have to thank Francis Moipu. For you, I have no words because whatever I can try to say, it will bring in me a lot of emotion. So I don't have to say anything. <laughs> so you, Esperance, Sacre, and Dion, my children, I thank you very much for being here with me. And uh, I don't have to mention the name of all my colleagues at the School of Languages and Literature. But I see you wherever you are sitting here. I see you. And even if I don't see you, I still feel your presence in me. <laughs> because this is literature, it has a spiritual part of it. So I feel your presence. You have been with me all the way since I'm here at Short University. I can reveal to you that if it was not about you, maybe I wouldn't have been here at Short University. But every time I see each one of you, I see the reason why I have to stay. And uh, I'm using for the occasion also to recognize those who are not here with us, but they sent me their messages. I'm talking about Dr. Ntosh Madri, who couldn't make it, Dr. Oh, Professor Dion Como has been called for other duties in Cape Town, but he told me that Dr. Tobi uh, will take notes for him. <laughs> so the same thing was said by Professor Pam Maseko, who was preparing to come, but who couldn't make it. She says to me, Dr. Tobi, Bulero Nusilela will take notes for her. <laughs> Dr. Peter Clayton also uh, sent me his apologies, but he didn't say that uh, Dr. Tubi didn't know Dr. Bowie, Professor Ordisho, Paul Arredisho, and also Ms. Agatha Runovich, these people couldn't make it for today. Everyone can read. 
This is where all of this started. This is an important village where I was born. You can read there. This is a territoire de Gandajika. So this is where all started. And uh, it is a village or a, uh, a spoken word. This is a village of traditional tradition, oral tradition. So in this village, you don't find easily laptop or smartphone. <laughs> Especially at the time when I was born, we didn't have any television. So you are there in that village, you can sit and relax and learn from mouth to mouth. This is a, a child that uh, my sister told me that could look like I was. Because at the time, we couldn't have photographs. I didn't have that. My sister said, you were looking like this. <laughs> but by looking like this, I only see two things. I see that this is a healthy child. But this child is also rich. This is a very rich child, and I think I was. I was very much privileged to be a rich child, despite the fact that I couldn't afford to have a photograph. <laughs> but I was rich. So we are, going to, uh, we are going to discover how rich I was. And uh, this is the primary school where I went, we called it Ecole Primaire in Colombo. I was there, but this picture is taken recently. Uh, the building didn't change that much, but this is how I was in a class. From the child that you see there, this child was nourished with the oral tradition. Every night I had to hear stories. I had to hear tales from others, especially from my mom, who was very good at it. My mom, yes, she, she was good at the storytelling, and her stories were recorded and published in Belgium by missionaries. Yes. And uh, yes. <laughs> Yes, I started to learn from her. Yes, my grandma was also there, but I didn't hear her very good in storytelling. <laughs> normally, it is grandma who must be very good, but in this case, my mom was better. <laughs> and now, I'm going to the primary school with all the stories from our cosmogony from everything around us in my mind. We always say every old man in, South, in Africa is a library. But before even I went to school, I could have some part of that library in me. Now I'm here at school, I'm learning what? I'm learning tales, but tells also from different worlds. We are here in a, a, a cotton world where we can learn French poetry. We can learn French poetry, but we don't throw away our Chiluba poetry. I have the Chiluba poetry. I also have the French poetry. I'm very rich at that time. You can see. Then we are there at uh, Collège Saint-Georges. At Collège Saint-Georges, we are starting something new. Remember, we have an oral tradition where we learn things, where we learn things from our ancestors. But we go there at the primary school, we mix things. But let me tell you something. 
before we leave this child forever. <laughs> I would like you to go with me, as we said, with, in the eyes of a young boy, we need to travel and to see something. I would like you to do something with me, as I did it with my mom. So can you can you say in you, boom, 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 boom? Okay, it creates some rhythm, but I would like that rhythm to be better. Okay. You just do that, boom, boom, boom. Okay, I'm going to, to be my mom, and you are going to do boom. Yes. And 
and uh, yes, it is a good town. And uh, yeah, this is my alma mater, which is Université de Lubumbashi, or Ililu. This is the uh, building where the vice chancellor is in that university. Uh, yes. And also, this is the faculty of uh, engineering. And uh, yes, this is uh, the emblems of the university, science and uh, conscience, the two together. Science and uh, conscience, we have that. And uh, you have to be told about it every day. You have to be reminded. <laughs> now, at this institution, we had the opportunity to start again debating Plato, Aristotle, Saint Augustine, Blaise Pascal, Lamartine, Balzac, Molière, Senghor, Alain Rogrier, Sarot, Cézanne, Chicago Tamsi, Thomas Mofolo, Jean Paul Sartre, Usman Senghor, Franz Fanon, all of them. So this is what you do when you are at that university. And it is not only you, but everyone with you. This is a normal day. Abba Fundi. You see them? <laughs> <laughs> so this is. Uh, I would have been like that as well. Like this. So, nah. Having said that, we are now here at Troy University for tonight. We have to travel, and we have to say something about moral imperatives. And uh, before saying it, we have this citation, this quote, il ne suffit pas de faire le bien, il faut encore le bien faire. It's not enough to do good, but it is important to do it well. This is also said, it, is been, it has been attributed to Denis Diderot, but it is something that is in Latin that I have seen years ago, uh, which said, Age cod agis. For some translators, they say, do well what you do. For others, they just say, do what you have to do. And for Voltaire, who has come also from that background, he will just say, work on your garden. Cultivate <laughs> your, your, your garden. Cultivate votre jardin. So now, having said that, we are going to interrogate moral imperatives. And uh, the moral imperatives are they in us without us, in nobis, sine nobis. We don't create them, but they exist in us. They have been placed in us at an extent that every time we don't do them, we feel like we are guilty, because they are already there in nobis, sin and notice. Mm -hmm. So we don't do that for fear of punishment or for uh, an expectation of some own personal gain or for habit. But it is done just as a calling to read in our own tempo. We have to read in our own tempo. So how do we read in our own tempo? We have said that uh, Literature is of a spiritual nature unless we write just as journalists. It's not bad to write as a journalist, but it is good to write as a journalist if you are a journalist. If you are a writer, you have to write as a writer. You don't report on everything you see around the street in a very bad manner. But literature in itself would like you, because you would like to write, to be a prophet, to see what other people can see during the day, but you can open your eyes 
to look into the temple like we have here, juxtaposition of universes or the myth of the temple. Yes, I'm saying temple, but you can see the, the garden. So why do I put a garden? Because I know that for some people, if I put a temple, they will say, oh, this temple is for Christian, I'm not. This one is for Buddhist, I'm not. But a garden is common to all of us. So in literature, we have a temple. Some people can call it a garden. Other people can call it a maze. But I'm calling it a temple. OK. And this temple should be at the border between the real world and the unknown world. So for you to be a prophet and a writer, you should be able to penetrate in the world that other people don't with your own eyes. That world is uh, at the border of the in, uh, empirical world. Some people are talking about sixth sense. Yes, you have to have it. As a critic, you have to look and see what other people cannot see. And as a writer, you will have to look and find it. That's why, when talking about temple, for those who are familiar with religions, people will tell you that the temple is not a building. Yes, you have to find a temple in you. You don't have to walk far to find the Buddha, but you can find the Buddha in you. For those who, who believe in, in Christ, they don't have to walk around, but they have to come inside themselves. In the Greek culture with Socrates, he always said, listen, listen to the divinity in you. For you to be able to do that, yes, you penetrate in your own temple. That's the writing, the true writing will allow you to penetrate there. So we have here a garden, a tango, where re, uh, writers have to penetrate. By penetrating there, they will reach the truth. And then, for some critics, for some critics, like Matthew, like Zakam, they will say, when you penetrate in the world, in this temple, this temple is pure. It is sacred. And here, in the empirical world, we are in a world which is not sacred, which is profound. It is not sacred. And then, then you bring something from afar, just like Plato is talking about the idea of world, the ideas, or the world of ideas, you bring something there and you expose it to other people. Yes, they do that. Good writers are able to do that, but now, how do we know that? Because for all of us, we might not be able to penetrate in that temple. How do we understand that? This is where the work of uh, a critic is there. A literary critic is the person who is going to help us to understand that work. You can say, you can see there, you can't read what is written, can you? Yes, I've done it uh, on purpose. <laughs> this is my paper, but I'm the only person who can read it and, and convey a message to you. This is how it works. So I am between the world that is sacred and the world that is secular. OK, it is just an image. I'm not saying that you, 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 you are not penetrating. <laughs> So I'm in between, as a critic, literary critic, I'm in between to be able to understand the language of the other world in order to bring it. Because for any other person, just like you, you can't read. But I can. I'm a sort of Sangoma. <laughs> I can read. So this is how it is. I told you you will read through the 
lines of a village boy. Yes, this is what I'm doing now. I can see. This is the paper, art and Henry. Yes. So you can read it. I will give you the full reference. Now, from that word, we have, among other things, I have just taken four moral imperatives that uh, critiques, literary critiques, will have to put to you. So, literary critique have penetrated the world of these writers and have brought something that they can share with all of us. So, the first one is the ethic of writing or epistemological change. The ethics of the otherness, the political ethics, and the ethic on gender issues. But what I'm saying here is, I'm talking about ethics. But it is not just ethics, but it is aesthetics. You see, I don't make a difference as a, 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 literal, a literature person between the good and the beautiful. In so many of the languages in Africa, you will find that we have just one word that is designated <coughs> good and beautiful. So you have one word. So in Shiluba, I, I will say bimba. I will say wimba. That will be a good person or a beautiful person. So I don't make any difference because we don't create. Those who create piece of art, they are not creating them to be just contemplated. They are useful. That's why they are good and they are beautiful. So if I say ethics, I also mean aesthetics. The same thing. It is the same thing in this context. Okay, now let's move on to see how they are being represented. The ethics of writing or epistemological change we have in front of us George Gard and Jean Baptiste Vico or the violation of the African speech. This is a novel. It was written by Ngal, George Ngal, as you see there. Ngal was a great professor in the DRC. I think he's still a professor. But now, what he did was, was to think of a way of writing that is reflecting the method and techniques that are common in African oral tradition. Remember, during the time of contest, Africans were, were known, and it was said, that they didn't have literature. And suddenly, they started to write. But now, are they going to write as African, or as French, or as English, or as anything? But this book is a reflection of technique from the tradition, oral tradition from Africa, how to write. Not how to write, yes but because it is uh, literature. How to say literature? How do you say it? So the techniques are being developed, not developed, but a reflection on those techniques that already exist. And uh, he has mentioned so many. You can see there what he says. I dream, Vico is a, 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 a character in that novel. He is a, a university professor. He knows Greek and Latin and French, of course. But he is dreaming of a novel based on the terror. A novel where the opposition
relation between diachronic and synchrony phase, where elements of different ages exist, a kinetic universe which generates an order and comes from it. I dream of and strive to achieve the fertilization of the novel by orality for the last two years. So, we have the a discussion which is started in a book, dreaming of techniques, of writing a novel, an African novel, not based on French thinking, not, no, not based on uh, any other, but the originality, the techniques, where do you find them? After reading this, I said to myself, yes, this is the point. He is talking about a tale, but I come from there. I know the tale. I would like to see if this can be found. If those who are writing have mastered the technique or the techniques of the tale. And then I ended up writing this book. Because in this book, I found those techniques. I found those techniques in some of the writing from African writers. African writers were writing in French, in English, but they were thinking as Africans. They were reflecting based on the way of viewing life, the world vision of Africa. And in this book, I have presented those kind of characteristics of an African choral tradition, piece of art. And uh, the conclusion was that the moral imperative on the form is the promotion of orality. The promotion of orality is very, very important for those who are writing today. The imperative is there. The imperative mood is an obligation. You have to be obligated to write by taking into consideration the past and the present and the future. You are writing, but in African way of saying things, just like in uh, the tales, I was saying here in Shiluba, you don't see much difference between the past, the present, the present, and the future. So you have everything put together. Everything put together. Just that is one element. And uh, you can find that maybe the, the space, consideration of space is not well defined. In my Chiluba, they will just say Kwatai Twakwaj, Uvuego. So this means somewhere. Well, we don't know. Somewhere. And also, it is important to keep contact with the audience. How do you maintain that contact in a tale? We have songs. Like I asked you to say, Poo. Poo. Can you say that again? <laughs> Poo. 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 So this is helping to maintain contact. And when you are reading, it's not like you have to, to sleep when you read. You read, and then something has to beat your heart. Yeah. But how do you do that in writing? Yes, it is easy. If you think, if you know the African tales, you will do that. This is the fatty function. And it is explained in that book. So this is a moral imperative. In terms of norms, epistemology, or techniques and methods of writing. And uh, the second imperative is to deal with the other. 
So we have to look in, to take into consideration the ethic of another person in literature. So how do we consider ourselves with other people? Do we take it into consideration when we are writing? Or when we are critiquing a book? Or we just read a book as a journalism report? Yes, that's not bad, but it's not helpful at all. So in this case, I have uh, written a paper which is called <coughs> La Traversée de l'Atlantique ou la mort. There is a question mark there, crossing the Atlantic. Crossing the Atlantic or dying. Or dying. <coughs> so there is a critical reflection on the concept of exchange. Crossing the Atlantic, you are here, you cross the ocean. You go on the other bank. Yes, that's comfort. This is coming from a, a reading of a book written by Fatou Diome. Fatou Diome wrote a book where he was, she was saying, uh, the title of the book is um, Le Ventre de l'Atlantique the belly of the Atlantic. So in the Atlantic, every time we see on the news, people trying to cross. And what happened to them? They die. They don't reach the destination. They die. And the very water, it is full of corpses. Corpses, huh? Yes, they are there. But now, my point is, I didn't look at it that way. Here, I'm reflecting on the exchange of culture. When a person crosses the Atlantic and reaches the other side, there is a possibility of killing their own culture. And there they, without any hope of returning, how is the exchange going? Is the culture coming back to Africa and the culture from Africa being transferred? Some people are saying it is dynamic, but I see it in this book as not being so. It is like some cultures are just dominant, or some people who are not rich before living. Huh? <laughs> These people might die in the Atlantic. So now, uh, in this book, there is a vast reflection of going and coming back. When you go and come back, alive, in one piece, when you go and come back, you are rich. And uh, the exchange can only mean that. And uh, you don't need to travel. You travel every day, everywhere. You read books, but you have some basis in you by reading some fiction. You are transported somewhere, but you need to have the feet on the ground to be able to put that everything into context, to explain something from Greek philosophy, to see the correspondence in the African way of living. I'm telling you that the temple is not different. There is no boundaries. Those writers from Greece, ancient or modern, they are going to the same temple. Of, with those writers coming from Gandajiga, they are going there, all of them, to have materials. So now, the reflection, uh, reflection critique is there to let readers know that what is written, yes, it is there, but are we going to die or not? Yes, dying is not bad, but it is not necessary. <laughs> okay, and now we have a message and the return. 
MSZ. I think you know MSZ. We are not going to talk a lot about him. But uh, what did he say? Yeah. Uh, I'm going to read in French. Uh, you are going to look at it in English. Um, yes, for some reason. <laughs> because uh, what he said in French, uh, there is a slight difference with what is in English. Partir. Mon cœur bruissé de générosité. Emphatique. Partir. J'arriverai lisse et jeune dans ce pays nien. Et je dirai à ce pays, dont les limons entrent dans la composition de ma chair, j'ai longtemps erré, et je reviens vers la hideur des herbes de vos plaies. Je reviendrai à ce pays mien, et je lui dirai, embrassez-moi sans crainte, et si je ne sais que parler, c'est pour vous que je parlerai. I think you have the translation there. So this is a message there. He is talking about going and return. Going and return. So this is part of the exchange. Because in terms of cultural exchange, the, 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 the forces shouldn't be uh, different. We have to bring the same forces in it. There is no way that you can consider uh, another force like it is not important. Everything is important. As long as we know ourselves as readers or as a critic what we are. If we know really what we are, we go and we can come back. And this is what we do every time. And this is what we have to do. So a message is saying something in connection with retail. And now, in, uh, to say something again in connection with the, um, the other, I have this metaphor, I, me, I in you, or the fullness. So this can be found in this book by Veronique Taggio, Loin de mon père, far away from my father. This is a novel. So in, I in you, this is the sage of myself, but I can find myself maybe with so many difficulties in myself. But I can find myself easily in you. When I see you, we recognize each other. And it is easy to see ourselves to discover ourselves by discovering others. This is the fullness. In this book, the paper I wrote is there to say entre vacuité et plenitude, between the void and the fullness. So, I'm alone, there is a void. That void, yes, I can be in a room like this with so many people, but in my temple, I'm alone. I'm alone. And when I come to you, when I reach you, I'm full. Being together, I in you, all the fullness. And uh, Tacho herself said, our role is therefore to break this confinement and to bring another world vision to be able to restore communication between people from different social backgrounds. This is an imperative. Our role as writers, because Tacho is a writer, I spoke to her, uh, that was in a library, about that. And she said, our role, my role, 
is to bring people together, to bring the communication among people. People would like to be on their own. How will they know themselves? It is difficult. The easiest way is to go and reach others. That is fullness. And when we reach others, then we recognize ourselves. Now, we can... Uh, Yes, the other imperative is uh, in connection with uh, the political issues, the political writing. Here we have the tradition from uh, ancient Greek, where you see Homer and other people. You have uh, Voltaire, you have um, the African writers such as Ari Lopez, Tony Labutanti, and you have Latin Americans like Marquez and so on. They are trying to describe what is not going on well politically in their writing. They will show the dictatorship. They will expose the killing. They will show so many bad things in relation to the politics. However, the question that I asked for myself it is to go beyond the politics. When a writer is writing about politics, does it mean that we have to read it as a journalism report? Remember that we said that there is nothing bad in reading journalism <laughs> reports. But we are literature people. We do not need to be on the surface. And now, beyond the description, whatever we see, uh, according to novels that we have analyzed in uh, African writing, remember that the anal uh, anal analysis of uh, uh, African literature is not uh, something that I stack in isolation. We link everything together. In that same paper, we'll find the comparison with Latin world, ancient Latin world, you will find the Greek world, you will find the French world. It's not something that is in isolation. Remember now that this is, uh, we have to go beyond. But by going beyond, the imperative that I have found from the temple is that some of the writers are trying to work on the construction of a national identity. It's not just about the, the crime, about um, uh, contesting uh, power or the regime or uh, trying to, to, to depict um, a dictatorship or trying to look for change in a country, but it is also about building the nation. They are trying to build the nation in Africa. Remember that nations that, that we have are not the way they used to be before 1885. But how do we build the other nations? And this is what is in this paper. After writing this paper, I had some emails and phone calls. But most importantly, the author of the book, Le Democratie de notre République, tried to contact me to say, it was difficult for me to express myself for people to understand me. Every time they interpret this novel, they don't reach what I needed to say. But after reading your paper, I found that it is very, very in line with what I was thinking of. Can you come with me in Brazzaville? Because the author is from Brazzaville, I'm from the DRC, the other side of the river. 
So at the time, political situation between the two Congos was not good. And then suddenly he calls me. He is in France, I'm in South Africa. Say, let's go to Brazzaville. I would like you to say what you have said in this paper publicly. <laughs> I would like you to say it publicly. This is what is lacking in our nation. So I understand. I asked him, what is very important, what, what is it in my paper that attracted your attention? He said, the nation building. That is something that you have found in my representation of character. Let's go and build the nation. Remember, the two Congos were together. But just the small one, yes, is there, occupied by France, and the other one by Belgium. But the people is the same. So, yes, that is an imperative, the nation building. But if you read it differently, you could say, oh, Zanzala is talking about a dictator, a big one, and, and so on. Yes, but beyond all of that, what is there? The imperative is there. It is the nation building. <coughs> now, uh, this is the last imperative, because it looks like the time is going, it is running. I'm going too quickly here. But I would like us to pay attention because this is very important. That's why it is at the end. Um, we are talking here about the ethics of the gender beyond the contestation and the passion. Yes, the contestation is there. So many uh, novels have been published about African women. So many poetry about African women. But most of these novels, most of these writings, and most of critics only look at the side of the contestation. They only look at the side of the abuse. They only see blood. They only see witnesses. Is, there the, uh, is this the only message that is conveyed by writers? Is this everything from the temple. The question is asked. The temple is sacred. And the world out there is secular. But if the writer is able to go to the temple, will he see only blood? Will he see only the abuse? Will he or she see only the abuse? Or there is something special that can enlighten other people? That's why my analysis reached this point where I say beyond the contestation. Yes, I remember years back I was also uh, doing some critique. I was critiquing in that way to say, yes, this is not uh, true to happen. This is bad, but now there was also the passion that was there. But the passion, what is it? I don't want to spend more time on the contestation, but I can <laughs> spend some time on the passion. The passion is there for the critique. Who can see something from the temple, something that elevates African women? or the women of the world. And this is what they bring out there for people to see. I can give you an example. Of the passion. But before we reach those two examples of the passion, I would like you to answer these questions. But I have a response. But I want you to repeat that response with me. Because if you don't repeat, you will sleep. <laughs> yes, OK. I'm asking this question. Who will see the beauty of our queens? What is 
the response to that? <laughs> okay, let's all say the poet. Yes. The poet. Okay, who will sing the beauty of our feet? The poet. Who will sing the beauty of our princesses from January to December? The poet. Who will immortalize the smile and care of our mothers? The Who will bring us hope during the time of despair? The Who should not be pessimistic all the time? The <laughs> when it comes to this topic, especially these women ones, let's all be poet. And uh, by saying this, I would like to read a poem which is written by Kamara Lev, and it was long ago. He wrote about his mother, and he, he said this. I, I, I'm not going to translate, but I know that for sure you will be able to capture it from the temple. I will read in French. Ah, ma mère. Femme noire, femme africaine, oh toi ma mère, je pense à toi. Do you feel the rhythm? Yeah. He's writing to his mom and he's saying, ah ma mère, femme noire, femme africaine, oh toi ma mère, je pense à toi. Oh my mom, I think of you. You see? Yes. Okay, uh, this is the fashion I was talking about. Only the poet can do that. He doesn't need to be optimistic or, or pessimistic all the time. And uh, another one, Petrarch, wrote something about, yes, his love. What did he say? I'm not going to translate, but you will be able to feel. You will capture something. Oh, <laughs> Shepherd. <laughs> Quand me revient à l'âme, le jour où j'ai laissé grave et pensive, Madame, et avec elle, mon cœur. Il n'y a aucune chose à quoi si souvent je pense. Je la revois tout humblement debout, parmi les moindres fleurs, ni joyeuse, ni triste. You see? So this is women's dance. We have that fashion. The poet to express that fashion. I'm of the view that this is very important. I'm the view that from the temple we shouldn't bring only abuse. And now, beyond the passion and the contemplation, there is something special. This is coming from the paper that I'm writing. It is to be published very soon. And what is there? This is the line of my research, as I will do it from now. It is the quest for the news. Yes. So the issue of women is in relation of the quest for the news. In literature, if you write or if you critique, you need to have the news. You see the imperative is there. Come. We are asking, we can see the movement that come, yes, the person that is called is a woman, has to move and to come to a person that we see who is desperate, who is, need, who is needing help. Come and restore the freshness and the sun to the humanity, to perpetuate your culture and mind. Here, we are beyond contestation, we are beyond passion, but we are in search of the views. Come, we are praying, come, and this is it. So, to conclude, after these four imperatives, we started with a young boy 
in a village. A young boy helped me at the village, and now there is another one. Looking through a window, looking at what? Looking into the street. Yes, into the street of literature. When we read literatures, we have said the tempo, we have said everything. But we are looking into ourselves. We see ourselves walking on the street. We see ourselves as characters. That's why I'm talking about imperatives. This is not possible if we cannot be also characters. We see ourselves walking in the street. I'm challenging you to try to reach the level of the temple, for you to see yourself walking in the street and feeding the fresh air, the freshness that is going to be brought by the news because of the call of the poet. And how do you feel that? Look through the window. See the other world and be yourself. You don't make the fence, but you are flexible to reach everywhere, to read Latin, to read Greek, to eat French, to eat literature in English, to read literature in Chiluba, to say something in Swahili. You are able to do that and to visit the temple. This is what I say to my students. And now, to, because the time is there, Bana Valmuntu. I'm translating this, just this one, to say, children of God, children of a person. Yes. Now, because I'm saying this, children of a person, how do you see them there? Happy. Rich. Yes. Happy and rich. They are happy <laughs> and they are rich. So I'm going to say something in my Chiluba, how this is represented. Yes, it was said in Chiluba, but I found it somewhere in French. And it was said that no, the French person actually inspired himself from Latin literature. But I was asking myself, but how did it end here? No. Someone else said, no, it started from Africa. Because the Africa is the cradle of what? <laughs> yes. And uh, other people said, no, that's not proven. And I said, but is it not that this, what I'm going to say now, was taken from the temple so that everyone in Argentina or in Brazil can also go there and take it? It, is, it shouldn't be a property of just one culture. Because I know it in French, I know it in, the, in Latin, and now in Chiluba, I saw it. So I'm saying it in Chiluba, but in English, yes, I said, children of a man. OK. Bana Babuntu. Yes. And what, what does it say? Bana Nue, Nujibana Bamuntu, Bamukasai Moitemu, Disanga Kai Busena, Chintupu Kai Bulena, Diga Sakai Wimpe Aje, Umujibana Bamuntu, Basomba Bamba Malu, Kakui Wachi Shimunda, Pamba Boka Tombeku, Matangungu Moikwenda, Chiji Biachu Chilumu, Chijamuni Chukuata, Pepe Uchela Kubanu, Katipika Chiji Chever, Chenza Matumulong Long, Nanguena Muntu Ever. Where was it? <laughs> Having said that, I thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> 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 I just like to say 
this opportunity to express Bob's my thanks, and I'm sure on behalf of all of you, your thanks to Professor Patrice Mwembu, who I've had the privilege of knowing for many years now and, and counting as a friend and, and colleague. He was also my teacher once, right? <laughs> <laughs> but not back then. Uh, <laughs> Patrice, you've taken us on a wonderful journey over the last uh, over the last uh, few minutes. Um, and you've shared your erudition with us, and you've presented us with what, in the current moment, I think, is a refreshing burst of humanism, which, to be honest, I sometimes despair might, might be going out the window. So I do acknowledge that, uh, uh, that contribution you've made. And obviously, you yourself have taken an immense journey from being that little boy. But I'm confident that you'll all agree that you have brought your mother with you in your storytelling uh, and your love and your grace. Thank you so much. Thank you.